The New Design Inference, a conversation with co-author Winston Ewart. Tell us about yourself. I'm Dr. Winston Ewart, and I am a software engineer. In my academic work, I've mostly worked in applying ideas from software engineering, computer science, and related fields to the subject of intelligent design. And in that connection, I've done work on computerized simulations of evolution, uh, specified complexity, modeling genomes as software projects, and that sort of idea. Uh, I pursued that while I got a PhD at Baylor University, where I worked with notable intelligent design proponents, Robert Marx and William Dembski. And as a consequence of working with William Dembski during that time, I was invited to come on as a co-author for the second edition of The Design Inference. Tell us about your new book. The book is about when we can infer design. That is, when we can conclude that something happened by a deliberate intent of an intelligent agent as opposed to happening by random processes. Uh, so we actually do this all the time, whether we think, see things like a sandcastle on a beach and we know someone deliberately designed and put that sandcastle there, uh, or we come home and the house has been organized, we know someone has deliberately organized the house, it didn't just randomly get put into those positions. And we always, in our everyday life, are able to draw these conclusions of design. And the book really is about taking that intuitive idea of when we can infer design and then solidifying and understanding the logic by which we do that and when we can apply that. This is an important issue because there are many cases where we're very interested in the question of whether or not something is produced by an intelligent agent or is just random chance. And in particular, perhaps the most interesting case is that of our own origins. Did we and the universe we inhabit come about by random chance processes, or is it the product of some sort of designed process? Uh, and it's, that's why the design inference is very important, because if we want to even begin to discuss that question, we have to understand the logic by which we draw these design inferences. Why was the original edition of the design inference so significant? The original edition of the design inference was so significant because it really laid the groundwork for the then burgeoning intelligent design movement. There have been design arguments going back to William Paley and even to ancient Greeks such as Aristotle, but there never really been a clearly laid out logic sort of underscoring why we're able to draw design inferences. And that's what the original edition really laid out, is what the logic was behind design inferences and sort of moved the design argument to a much more rigorous foundation that it had ever been put on previously. And you can see the influence of this in numerous intelligent design works that came out and would cite the original edition of the design inference as providing the underpinning logic of their argument. What new material is contained in this updated edition? The new edition seeks to be clearer, more understandable, and simpler uh, than the original edition. Uh, we've particularly simplified it by focusing a lot more on description links, which provide a simpler and more practical way of understanding specification that was developed in the original edition. We also have a lot more development of practical examples showing how the design inference applies in different scenarios, making it just a much more applicable and understandable um, work than the original edition. Can you explain the explanatory filter? The explanatory filter is a flowchart which distills the basic logic of the design inference. It's sort of the steps you have to go through in order to conclude that something is designed. The first step of that flowchart is to ask whether or not the thing is specified. That is, ask whatever event you're looking at, you ask, does it adhere to some independent pattern? Or, as we sort of explicate more fully in the second edition, does it have a short description? And when it doesn't have a short description, then we conclude it could have happened by chance. Because essentially, if it doesn't have a short description or it's not specified, it just looks kind of random. And that could happen by random chance. But once you've concluded that it is in fact specified, that it adheres to some sort of independent pattern, then you can move on to the second node of the flowchart, which asks whether it's improbable. Now, perhaps obviously, if something is probable, then it could happen by chance, because that's basically what probability means. But if it's improbable, then it can't be explained by chance, as long as it's also, as discussed in the first node, that it's specified. So when you have together the two nodes, that it's specified and it's improbable, then you conclude that it was produced by design. And that's the basic idea of the explanatory filter. What was the most serious objection to the original design inference? So over the years, I've interacted with various people trying to make objections to the arguments of the original edition of the design inference. 
And pretty consistently, they were always objecting to something that wasn't in the original edition of the design inference. They were always objecting to sort of misunderstandings or misconceptions of the argument. And so in many ways, the most serious objection really wasn't anything in the argument, because I think honestly, the design inference argument is very simple and straightforward, and you can't really object to the basic logic of the design inference. But the primary problem is that there were a lot of people who were misunderstanding it. And I think that showed that the original edition could have been somewhat clearer and better explained what it was talking about. And I think that is perhaps the greatest weakness of the original edition is some of that clarity of presentation. And that's something I think that has been much improved in the second edition. What was the least serious objection to the original design inference? It's hard to really identify the least serious objection uh, because there's so many non sequiturs which have been launched at it that you know, it's hard to even pick one. Uh, the one that really sticks out to me perhaps though is that someone who due to a confusion of units tried to argue that in order to infer design, the probabilities would have to be so low that they couldn't possibly ever happen. Uh, and that you could never draw a design inference under any circumstances anywhere. And I think that's just self-evidently goofy. And I think that's perhaps the least serious objection that I've come across. What did you contribute to the new edition? I've contributed to the new edition of the design inference in a number of ways. I'd published a number of papers on algorithmic specified complexity, developing some of these ideas beforehand. And much of that was incorporated in the new edition in a development of the idea of a description length. And that's something that I think uh, majorly helps simplify the ideas of the second edition of the design inference. I also helped develop the more Bayesian logic that is in the second edition, showing that whether you're a Bayesian or a frequentist, both camps can actually accept the logic behind the design inference. I also developed a number of the more practical examples showing some calculations for things like Mount Rushmore or the face on Mars and these different examples showing how they fit within a specified complexity framework. How has your background as a software engineer helped? One of the key things in my background as a software engineer is that I have to deal with things that are very theoretical and bring them into practical use. Uh, because, you know, with computer technology, we're dealing with some very theoretical and abstract concepts that sort of make the computer work, but we're trying to do very practical and useful things just for the general population. And so there's a constant practice of taking the very theoretical and moving it into the practical. And in many ways, I think that's sort of at the center of a lot of my contributions to the second edition was taking the very theoretical and making it more practical. And I think that's a way in which my background as a software engineer has really helped. Is there anything else you'd like to share? So I think it's really important to realize that most people shouldn't really object to the basic logic of the design inference. You may object to particular scenarios where we draw design inferences, but the basic logic is pretty straightforward. Uh, there are some people who might have philosophical objections to it, but most people actually accept the basic logic of the design inference, but they dispute that it applies in particular scenarios. So the design inference is really just about that basic logic. It's not really so much about whether it applies in individual situations. So we argue, for example, that bacterial flagellum is improbable and therefore the basis of a design inference. Now, many people will dispute that and claim, well, actually, maybe a bacterial flagellum, if you take into account all the evolutionary mechanisms, isn't that improbable. Now, we disagree with that, but the basic logic of the design inference is not about whether or not the bacterial flagellum is improbable. It's about what we can conclude from its improbability. So the basic logic of design inference is something we should basically all agree on, and we can focus our dispute on the more narrow question of, is it actually an improbable to see things like bacterial flagellums?